Hi, and welcome to today's episode of Short Rounds Roundtable. I'm your host, Short Round. Today, we're at Shiloh. This is one of my all-time favorite places to come, to study, to spend time. It's just, if you've never been to Shiloh National Military Park, this is an absolute bucket lister, I promise. It is well-preserved, it is pristine, the staff here is overly friendly. It is just an awesome place to come and really understand the American Civil War, but more importantly, one of the most pivotal portions in the early war, which is Shiloh. And part of that is explained by the monument behind me. The monument behind me is entitled Defeated Victory. With such a name, it, you know, it's kind of kind of backwards from how it should be, you know? It's either victory or defeat. It's never both. But in this case, for the Confederacy, it was. The first day of battle was April 6th, 1862. It was intended to be earlier than that by Albert Sidney Johnson and his staff. However, when they left Corinth en route for Shiloh to surprise the Federal Army, the rain, the muck, and the mud made a single day trip, if not less, days en route. But when they finally did get here and they laid in wait on April 5th, and they were so close that they could hear the Federal Army drilling, they knew they still had that element of surprise. They had the numbers, they had the munitions, and they had that element of surprise. But history tells a different story than the victory they had hoped for. This side of the monument, the soldiers are erect. They stand tall, prepared for the day's fight ahead. Their heads held high and they're confident in the victory that they know they can win. But as we know through the first day, did not go as planned. Nothing went as planned. By mid-afternoon, Albert Sidney Johnson had received a wound behind his knee. He couldn't feel it because of a dueling incident that had happened many years ago. He had no feeling and no way of knowing he had been struck behind his knee. And what made it worse was the heel of his boot had been shot as well. So all the blood that drained into his boot, he had no idea it was there. It was just pouring out through the hole in the bottom of the boot. That's why in the center, the angels mourn, Albert Sidney Johnson is there in the middle, in the middle of the battle of those two days he would fall and it would change the tide of not only this battle but the war itself because after the first day Beauregard who is now in command would wire Jefferson Davis and tell him that he has pushed the Federals back he has won the day and that the battlefield was theirs but what he didn't know was Don Carlos Buell would arrive later that night Nathan Bedford Forrest would actually get reports of Don Carlos Buell's army arriving that night. And he would try to run it up the chain of command. He would try and tell anyone who would listen, but no commander would. And that's why we have the other half of this monument. If you look, the heads are low. The flag is furled. Weapons put away. It was a sad day for the Confederacy. And it was a sad day for every man here. But the monument behind me is entitled Defeated Victory and I think it's named appropriately. Behind me is the monument to Brigadier General W.H.L. Wallace. He was a federal commander, and one thing to note that I really think is uh, <laughs> something you don't really hear of these days anyway, is his wife managed to, days before the Battle of Shiloh, she managed to hop on a steamship somewhere near Cairo and she made her way down here to Pittsburgh Landing. When she did, it was the morning of April 6th when she finally arrived. She had no idea that her husband would be mortally wounded that day. However, after his body was found and he was back in federal care, his wife did tend to him for several days before he passed. In her memoir, she notes that he did, in fact, know who she was, or at least said he did. He was able to squeeze her hand. And you have to remember, this is a, a head injury. He was shot through the head. 
but he managed to at least retain the memory of his wife, and he was able to talk to her at least one more time before he did perish. It's not the story for many of the men here at Shiloh. In fact, that's the story of maybe one or two of the entire war, if you really think about it. It was such a rarity for your wife to find you after the heat of battle. But she did. She found her husband. And he was not far from this spot when he was found by his own troops. But that's just something to think about in a neat little story. One of many here at Shiloh National Military Park. Behind me is one of my favorite pieces and really a fantastic uh, tribute and monument, if you will. Behind me is Ruggles Battery, one of the most famous artillery batteries of the entire war. It wasn't a single company, it wasn't part of a regiment. Ruggles Battery was a makeshift battery here at Shiloh. General Daniel Ruggles tried his best to push the Federals out of the hornet's nest, which lay about 400 yards to my right. The, all these gun barrels are still pointed at the same place they were. The Federals were thick in the hornet's nest. They had time to reinforce, both with physical reinforcements and breastworks, and they did have troops come up. Most all of General Benjamin Prentice's men, and that's who was in the hornet's nest and down there at the sunken road, they would fight tooth and nail all day. The battery behind me, its sole purpose was to push them out. It was to drive them to the point where they didn't want to be there anymore. That bombardment was supposed to be a holy hellfire raining upon the Federals to move them out of their, their just hard-fought location. Unfortunately, that wouldn't be the case. Almost every cannon here would shoot over what they were intended to shoot at. The Federals would remain in the hornet's nest, even though this bombardment was going on, up until around 4 o'clock. The old saying, more dead bodies attract more dead bodies, was a very true statement for the hornet's nest in the ground in front of me. As Prentice put up such resistance to the hornet's nest, he would not give up an inch of what he claimed is there that day. And as many people pushed against it, as many Confederates tried and tried with the bombardment of Ruggles Battery, no headway. But like I said, dead bodies attract dead bodies. And though Prentice was in the middle, and you had Bragg and Beauregard on either side, men from both sides of the hornet's nest would hear what was happening, hear this major bombardment, hear this ground-shaking hell, and they would turn. And eventually, General Prentice was surrounded on all sides. Now, this took away fighting men from the rest of the battle, but it did encumber them. And with that, General Prentice and all of his men that didn't die would be captured here, partially thanks to Ruggles' battery. For had it not been for the noise, for the deafening, lumbering artillery boom, they wouldn't have been as attracted to the situation. They wouldn't have stayed. They wouldn't have come around. And it would have played out different for General Prentice and his men. But that wasn't the case. So in a way, thank you, General Ruggles. Not only did you make history by having the largest battery in the Western Hemisphere up until that point, but you did, in fact, play your part in helping to capture the hornet's nest.